all my notes things here. It's a good, good morning. Good morning to church on this beautiful, beautiful day that God has given us. You know, we live in Michigan. Any day it's not snowing is a good day, isn't it? <laughs> so there you go. Welcome on this uh, second Sunday in Advent, or, or excuse me, after Pentecost. Um, but also, this is the first Sunday of summer, right? So the days get a little shorter of daylight all after this. But we won't worry about that because it's just a beautiful day to be worshiping God together. So again, welcome today. You found the relationship card in the bulletin if you came in. If you'd please uh, fill that out and when we take the offering, drop it in there. That would be greatly appreciated. This is how we keep track of attendance. And also look for any, any uh, concerns that you have to share on the back or joys because these get lifted up to the Lord in prayer during the week. I pray over these uh, uh, throughout the week. So please take advantage of that. You see one other uh, insert in there called Freaky Fridays? That's going to start this Friday, June 27th. And Freaky Fridays is like a day camp for the children that live in the area around the Salvation Army here in Bay City. And I participated at that last year on a few uh, few Fridays. And from uh, talking to the kids, uh, that's a wonderful experience for them. We sing songs, do crafts. Uh, eat some food, and uh, also do some Bible study in the chapel there at the Salvation Army. But the thing I noticed most about those kids is that uh, uh, that's the only meal many of them have that day, is the lunch and the snacks that they have uh, during the day. They won't have anything else uh, at all until dinner time, meaning if they weren't at Freaky Friday, so they wouldn't have anything to eat until dinner time. So it's a wonderful service that we do. There's usually always 30 to 50 kids there, and it's just a great time. So um, uh, do look, on, uh, uh, look at that sheet. We need a few more volunteers and things. Talk to Marty Doring uh, if you uh, feel moved to, uh, to uh, serve in that area. Next Sunday is our one-year anniversary, and we're going to have a great celebration. There will be one service at 1030. How many services next week? One at 1030, and it's going to be right here. It's going to be out on our lawn. We're going to have a big tent out there. Because if everyone comes, we can't fit everybody in here. So rather than going and renting someplace else, we, uh, the team said, uh, let's worship here. We'll have our fellowship time, our potluck dinner afterwards here. So we're going to be out on the lawn under a tent. A big tent will be out there, and everyone, I'm sure, will be covered. And we'll have a great time. We have the music ministry family, the Thurstons, is going to come and leave the worship service. We're going to, t- to pay for them for their travels here and their time. We're going to take a love offering for the Thurstons. So that will be the offering that we, uh, we have uh, uh, during the worship service. Any loose money that's in the plate will go to the Thurstons and also to give any um, uh, additional to them. When you write your normal pledge check, uh, whatever you'd like to add, just put that in the memo for the Thurstons, and um, we'll be able to uh, uh, celebrate with them as well and share with them our love as they come to lead us in a great celebration worship service. It'll be a potluck dinner immediately afterwards in our fellowship hall, so bring a dish to pass, and we'll have a great time. And also, uh, we did a good count of our folding chairs, and we probably don't have enough, so you're welcome to bring your own lawn chair when you come to worship next Sunday. All right, then one other uh, item just to share, no insert, but it's in the, in the bulletin. Our vacation Bible school starts tomorrow on Monday. Maybe you saw some of the props and things that are setting in the hallway and ready to be put up. Uh, there's two additional boards out in our fellowship hall, one where uh, we need some volunteers or in some other roles, so look for that. And then also there's another board out there. If you haven't already picked up a registration form for your children or your grandchildren, you're welcome to do that. I'd like for you to look at the person next to you or sitting near to you and say to that person, God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. (laughs) Ah, God loves you. God loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Let's stand and greet one another and especially the guests who are with us today.
Good morning. We prepare this morning with our introit, Surely in the Presence of the Lord, number 328. They're located in hymnals underneath your chairs. Join me in the call to worship. The Lord listens to us in times of trouble and joy. We call to the Lord in our anxiety and fear. God will not turn away from us. God will heal us and restore us. Let the Lord of life enter into your spirits. Opening hymn, Go Make All Disciples, number 571 in your hymnal. Join me in a unison prayer. Gracious and loving God, come to us in our fears and frustrations. We feel unable to serve and often beat down by life. Give us courage and strength. Help us joyfully serve you by serving others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now 
I'll pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Come on up and join me. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I want to sit down here with these girls. Yeah. So how strong do you two think you are? Are you strong? Huh? How about this? How about this dumbbell? Can you lift that dumbbell? Yeah, all right. Yeah, look at that. Yes, you're strong. How about a car? Do you think you could lift a car? No, no. Well, you know, I bet you could with some help. I bet you could with some help. This is called a hydraulic jack. And if you place this under your car, work that for me. That works real easy. And see this coming up? That will lift a car. This little thing? This little thing is with everything that's down in here, that'll lift a car. Pretty amazing, huh? So you'd be strong enough. You couldn't do it by yourself. But with the help of this, you could lift a car. You know, there's other things that, that burden us sometimes that, that make us struggle under the weight that feels like a car. Maybe you were having trouble in school this last year with a class or a teacher and you were struggling with that. Or, or maybe there was, there was just a bully at school that, that you didn't like. Maybe there's somebody in your family that's, that's really sick and you're worried about them. You know, God told us that we don't have to, to carry burdens all by ourselves. The scripture, the Bible verse that the adults are going to hear a little later, is when Jesus said to, the, to everyone, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus said we don't have to carry the weight of a car around on our shoulders worrying about something. There's lots of places in the Bible where, where we're told that we have God's help. In Genesis, we hear, don't be afraid, I am with you. And in Psalm 28, I'll give you strength. And in Psalm, 20, in Psalm 34, I'm with you in times of trouble. So we don't have to go it alone. We've got Jesus that'll help us. And, and he's there when times get tough to carry the weight of whatever we're carrying, he'll take on. Now, does that mean that if we ask him, God's going to take away all our troubles? No, no. Because sometimes we have troubles to make us grow stronger to make us realize that we have to trust in Jesus, that, that he, we have to lean on him sometimes. So sometimes we're challenged by stuff just, just to make us realize how much Jesus can help us. So will you remember that, to ask for Jesus for help when you need it? Okay. Can we pray? Yeah. yeah. Hmm? You want to hold here? Yeah. Dear Jesus, we're so thankful that when we have struggles, you're there to help us. Just help us remember to ask you for help to carry our loads. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You can head back to the nursery. Thank you, Renee. A very good lesson in there today. And thank the children for, uh, for helping as well. So very good. As we prepare our hearts and minds for our prayer time, I'm not aware of anyone in the hospital this week, but uh, we know that there are others that are sick and ill. And also there are others that are having great joy this week, particularly recent graduates. And uh, we want to lift everyone up in our hearts as we uh, go to our Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day and this time of worship and fellowship together. You quietly call us into service, Lord, 
not offering the road of easy service and cheap discipleship, but rather sharing with us the needs of the world and proclaiming that you will be with us always. Our ministries of faithful service are based in the knowledge of your powerful healing presence and mercy. Give us courage, Lord, to be your disciples. Let us be bold in our proclamation of your healing mercy in our attitudes and our actions. Forgiving God, we pray for your Christian church around the world especially in North Africa and the Middle East, where extremists persecute Christians daily. We pray for all people who believe in you to live in peace and to show unconditional love for one another. We pray for our Grace Church, as you call us to be Jesus' disciples. We pray for the needy in our mission field. and We pray for the unchurched, Those who do not know Jesus, guide us to go out and witness, to invite, and to welcome all to know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And Lord, we pray for a wonderful vacation Bible school this week. We welcome the children that you send to us and place in our care. And we lift up to you the vacation Bible school leaders who give of their time to teach lead crafts and games, sing songs, prepare food, have fun, and to share the love of Jesus Christ. Our merciful God, we lift up to you other issues and people near and dear to us that are on our hearts and on our minds. You have heard all our prayers. You know our needs and our concerns. And dear God, we accept the answers and the love that you give to us. Let us now pause in silent meditation to connect with God, to share our joys, and to confess our sins. words of assurance. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Rejoice in the comfort of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher, our example, our redeemer. Amen. Please stand if you're able for our hymn of preparation. I sing the almighty power of God.
Please be seated. Our first scripture this, this morning comes from Acts 14, verses 15 through 19. Friends, why are you doing this? We are mortals just like you, and we bring good news, that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to follow their own ways, Yet he has not left himself without a witness in doing good, giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, and filling you with food and your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came there from Antioch and Iconium and won over the crowds. Then they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Thank you, Rick. Rick Green, our liturgist this morning, and uh, Joellen Braun, our organist, and Kay Rowley, pianist, or, or, or organist. She's a pianist. You're the organist. Thank you. And way in the back, way in the back, Bill Hewlett and B.J. Burger, who makes it sound good. Thank you. Wave to them back there. They get lonely sometimes. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Well, that passage we just heard from Acts is an example of devoted trust in God in times of deep trouble. Jesus instructs us that when we are in deep trouble, when our burdens are heavy and seem insurmountable, to come to him, and he will give us rest. Let us hear Jesus' teaching, reading from Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 17, and then continuing with verses 28 through 30. Jesus said, But to what will I compare this generation? It seems like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. Continuing verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of God for us, the children of God. Thanks be to God. May we be in an attitude of prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts Be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, someone, I don't know who, but someone, they rightly called Matthew chapter 11 uh, as a recital for what the church is in today's world. At first glance, you might not see it that way, but let's look a little bit closer, shall we? This chapter 11 actually begins a whole new section of Matthew's gospel. We learn in the very first verses of chapter 11 that John the Baptist is in Herod's prison, languishing in a dungeon. John is hoping with every hope that Jesus is the promised Messiah. So John sends messengers to Jesus asking, Are you the one who is to come, or are we we to wait for another? But Jesus answers the Baptist questions by recounting the work that God is doing in the world. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news brought to them. And Jesus then praises John, stating that among those born of women, no one is greater than John the Baptist. And then right after that, we come to our sermon text. With rhetorical puzzlement, Jesus asks, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, but you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. Now, Jesus could have been commenting on his cousin John's doubts that Jesus is the Messiah. 
but more likely he's commenting on the society and the culture that he experienced on his ministry travels. In other words, Jesus is saying we are fickle and restless, unfulfilled in laughter and unmoved in mourning. We act like spoiled children, Jesus says, never satisfied, but often complaining. You see now why some scholars say that this chapter 11 in Matthew is a commentary on the present day church? A few years ago, when contemporary worship was all the rage, almost every church, no matter what its history, no matter what its actual context indicated, most churches believed that they absolutely had to have a contemporary worship service to reach people, particularly the young church. And even today, some of the United Methodist churches going through Vital Church Initiative, they receive a a very positive prescription to start a contemporary worship service or a blended service based on their context today and their target audience. You see, a contemporary worship service will work in proper context. And then several decades ago, all the rage in the church was the gifts of the Spirit. And in other times, the trend was books commenting on the the book of revelations that were just filled with half-baked ideas on the world's end. And those books literally flew off the bookshelves. In another time period, spirituality was popular. In another, it was music. And yet another, it was recreational binges. And in still another time period, it was mission endeavors. Do you ever, do you, any of you remember the one-time popularity of the Peace Corps? Perhaps it's always been that way, but ours seems like such a restless, moody, unsatisfied generation of Christians. Well, after some time, Jesus, weary from all the restless roamings of his followers, he looks to heaven and he prays. The substance of his prayer offers thanksgiving to God that the basic core meanings of life are really simple. They're rooted in a childlike faith built on trust. And that trust, according to Jesus, is found when we cast our restless lives on God's unchanging, faithful presence. Listen again, please, and and hear the invitation of our Lord. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, there are no more eloquent, winsome, nourishing words in all the scriptures than those. Jesus' words are soothing, his words are gentle. They're peaceful. Even though Jesus said earlier in Matthew chapter 10, everyone will hate you because you believe in me, you will be persecuted. And then Jesus says in chapter 11, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That seems confusing, doesn't it? So what's God really saying to us? Well, I interpret three possibilities, and I'm sure there are many more. First, nothing can hold the place that's reserved in our lives for Jesus Christ. Come to me is still the invitation our Lord extends to each one of us. Yes, Jesus looks for us, finding us when we don't even realize that we are lost. That's God's prevenient grace for us. But we have to accept Jesus' invitation to come to me. So why do we chase after things that can never satisfy us? Choose your worship style. Embrace whatever theological opinion of the day seems important. Read the latest book written by the toted best uh, Christian mind of the day, and you will still long for a personal heart-to-heart relationship with Jesus Christ. 
when our restless lives plop exhausted in the uncomfortable spiritual chair of our own making, we will still long to come to Jesus. Second interpretation, come to Jesus in your exhaustion and weariness. Our Lord recognized this restless tendency in us. Psychologists call the urge to travel about, they call that wanderlust. In my opinion, every human being is infected with spiritual wanderlust. We look here, we look there for meaning, and without fail, we find ourselves exhausted in every search that does not include a personal connection with Jesus Christ. Viktor Frankl, uh, an Austrian Jew, survived the horrors of Auschwitz as a prisoner under Nazi Germany, and he wrote a book that now, years after his death, is still printed and reprinted. It's titled Man's Search for Meaning, and it is Frankl's story of courage and survival in which human beings came through to the other side of the Nazi madness with meaning in their life. Now, how is that? Simply put, Frankel believed that the supreme need in every life is not pleasure, as Sigmund Freud suggested, or for great power, as Alfred Adler proposed, but rather the highest need in every life is for meaning. All of us long for meaning that transcends our work, that transcends every one of our successes, and even life itself. See, our Lord invites us to find in him the energizing, vital meaning that life offers. And that discovery begins when we come to him. When we come to him and and when we acknowledge that we are exhausted and that we're empty from spiritual wanderlust, and that has taken us to places rather than to a relationship with Jesus. Thirdly, we can interpret that our Lord promises rest for the restless. We are a culture and society that longs for answers, for solutions, neat formulas for success, And we want it now. But here our Lord offers rest. I will give you rest, says Jesus. When life implodes on us, when death robs us of a loved one, or disappointment snatches a fellowship from our future, when even faith seems hollow and answerless, our Lord offers rest for our souls. Now, if you think about that for a moment, if you have answers but no rest, what do you have but just a string of words? God in Christ Jesus offers us a much better gift. And how is that? Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I like to interpret and apply those words in this way. When we begin to follow Jesus, we enroll in the school of Jesus, and we never graduate. The Christian journey is one in which we are lifelong learners, disciples of the one who loved us even until death. The rest for which we long can finally and supremely be found when the one who loved us all the way to Calvary and beyond, when that one becomes the one in whom we learn to trust now and always. We need to stay focused on Jesus. Staying focused on Jesus is another way of interpreting Jesus' words, come to me and I will give you rest. And the best example of staying focused on Jesus Christ is my personal human role model, the Apostle Paul. In the passage we heard from Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas were in the city of Lystra preaching the good news of Jesus. And while there, through the power of God, Paul healed a crippled man. 
And the people who witnessed the miracle healing, they thought that Paul and Barnabas were gods. And they wanted to make sacrifices to them and worship them. Well, about that time, Jews from Antioch and Iconia, they arrived. And those were the last two cities where Paul and Barnabas had been. And these Jews, they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they won over the gathered crowd. And they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Now imagine that scene. Paul stoned and left for dead. I'm pretty sure it wasn't the part of Paul's, uh, that it was not part of Paul's plan that day or any day to get pelted with rocks and left for dead. But God intervened in an apparent miraculous way. Paul's few disciples gathered about him, and he rose up, and he entered the city. Now, we don't know exactly what happened. Were the disciples helping him walk? Was Paul fully and completely healed? We don't know for certain. But what I can tell you for sure is that Paul wasn't going to forget that treatment anytime soon. Being stoned was a particularly brutal and painful way to die. You see, the stoners, they they didn't use just tiny little rocks. They threw the largest stones they could accurately hurl. Bones were crushed. Internal organs were severely damaged. Skin and flesh were torn. Arteries and veins ruptured. It, It wasn't pretty. And that scene and the accompanying pain he felt was surely embedded in the mind of the Apostle Paul. He probably even remembered how he had given his approval and then stood at the side and held the cloaks of those who stoned Stephen to death in Acts chapter 7. Regardless, Paul's plans for preaching the gospel that day had been greatly altered. And it could have altered his plans to ever preach the gospel again. It could have been easy for Paul to say, The cost is too high. Even if God had healed him, the memory of that stoning lingered on. Was he willing to go through that again? Would you be willing? But what did Paul do? He went on with Barnabas to the city of Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch. Paul returned to the very places where he recently had been severely mistreated. And what did he do there? The scriptures tell us that Paul was encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Now how could Paul have done that? How could he look beyond the circumstances and the pain to see God's hand in every situation? Perhaps the answer is found through Paul's writings in Philippians 4 and Romans 8. In those two uh, letters, the, the Apostle Paul wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Rejoice in the Lord always. You see, Paul's focus wasn't on himself, but on God. And witnessing the good news of Jesus Christ as God had called Paul to do. So let me ask you, how do you react when difficulties come at you? I would encourage you, if you don't handle those things like Paul did, to turn to God, to ask for forgiveness and for guidance, and give up your burdens. Ask God to allow you to see from God's vantage point. None of the situations that Paul faced, or that we face, have ever been a surprise to God. And the way to begin to view those situations from the Lord's perspective is by spending time in his word. 
see his greatness, recognize his majesty, behold his power, glimpse his timelessness, rest in his faithfulness and in his love. At the end of the day or the week or even a life, there will be one who welcomes our wandering and our confused and our restless lives. And I commend this one to you today as the Lord of life, the Lord of love, the Lord of all, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let us pray. Lord, we know that We don't always handle difficulties the way that Paul did. Forgive us. We ask that you give us eyes to see you in the midst of those struggles, to recognize that you are ultimately in control and that compared with eternal life with you, these are mere momentarily afflictions. We ask that you give us your strength as we help others to focus their eyes on you, We learn from you, Lord. Your yoke is light. You are forgiving and gentle. And we find rest in you. Amen. Let us now give back to our Creator with our tithes, our offerings, and our gifts. And also please uh, remember to turn in your relationship card during the offering.
Our gracious God, we ask that you accept these gifts that we give back to you. Dear Lord, guide us in their use so that we may go forward and show the love of Jesus so that they, others who do not know him, may know the rest and the joy that comes in being with him. Amen. If you're able, please stay standing for our closing hymn, Holy Spirit, hum, come, confer. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. And the Greek word for easy is Christos, Christos. And it means fitting well. So Jesus' yoke, Jesus' work fits us well. And Jesus' work was to love. So go and love one another and you will find rest. May the blessings of the triune God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Go with you this day and forevermore. Amen.